This is Advanced Autonomy. I'm Luke Renner. My guest today is Carl Brackpool. He's a research associate at the Colorado School of Mines, where he not only works to advance the next generation of mining technology, but also to develop opportunities for greater environmental efficiency and sustainability across the entire industry. In addition to his work at the Colorado School of Mines, Mr. Brackpool worked at Hexagon Mining from 2017 to 2019, where he led initiatives to bring new mining technologies to market. In this conversation, we'll be discussing the intersection of the mining sector with autonomous vehicles and other new technologies. Hi, Carl. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Luke. I appreciate it. You are a researcher at the Colorado School of Mines. Can you tell me a little bit more about what you do there and and what you're working on? Sure. This is my sixth year as a research associate at the Colorado School of Mines here in uh, Golden, Colorado. I started out at mines in the mining engineering department, but over the evolution of seven years, worked on more and more interdisciplinary research projects that brought in other departments like computational sciences and mechanical engineering, uh, electrical engineering, robotics, and now doing a lot in additive manufacturing and material sciences and sort of creating a nexus where all of those different departments meet, but still under the guise of extractive in, um, extractive industries like mining. Are there anything interesting that you're working on these days that you'd like to talk about? There's, it's always a hotbed of engineering research, uh, both applied research from uh, corporate sponsored research programs, but also quite a bit of uh, institutional research funded by uh, large agencies like DARPA, the Department of Energy, NREL, um, National Science Foundation, and a lot of what are called SBIR grants for various research projects. But I'd say probably the, the coolest ones we've been working on in the last 12 to 18 months and right through the pandemic with very little slowdown are in the areas of circular economies and repurposing wastes from different industries. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm also part of a seven person committee uh, to explore mining engineering degrees that incorporate more about space mining. So what are we going to do when we go off terrestrial you know, off terrestrial uh, to look for setting up mining operations, maybe remote operations on the far side of the moon, and things like turning basalt rock or moon rock into materials that we can pump through 3D printers in additive manufacturing so that we can we don't have to lift a lot of things off the earth and break the break the bonds of gravity, but we can actually build robots in space or on other planets or on asteroids. Wow. That's really incredible. Yeah, the last time we had someone talking about mining, we ended up having a lot of discussion about uh, these asteroids that have these massive gold deposits and the opportunities for for on the moon mining. Do you think that stuff is coming relatively quickly or are we a few decades off? No, it's coming quickly. There was a period where from the pure mining side, as we teach mining engineers and we, we have a product that goes out as, as a qualified uh, degreed mining engineer that are highly sought after in industry, um, that was down the road. Those, are, those aren't the disciplines that we brought into pure, pure mining uh, career track or course track or course objectives. But now uh, we have entire divisions on campus. We have a group dedicated just to space exploration, space mining. And now the mining engineering department is working with that group to talk about how quickly we can put robots on the moon. There has been some success in privatizing space travel, really, to put private robots on other planets and on asteroids. And for the reasons you said, there's there's a number of deposits that are that are dwindling here. We're running, we're exhausting those deposits like rare earth elements. And we see that those are an opportunity in space, as well as if you think about the search for water, which has become topical in the last um, the last several years with uh, SpaceX and a lot of work that's being done on Mars is the discovery of water is huge. And that can even be ice crystals in the tails of comets and asteroids because we mm-hmm. can convert that water into hydrogen and there is your fuel source, which has been a real stumbling point for how do we continue to advance uh, space vehicles to go further and further to do exploration and, and eventually production. 
Wow, that's really fascinating. You know, I heard that there's water on the moon also. So it sounds like there's going to be a lot of options for extraterrestrial fuel sources once we finally get on with it here. So you mentioned robotic mining on the moon, which of course is a nice segue to start talking about autonomy. Where is the mining industry at in its autonomy journey overall? If you go back to say 2008 to pick a specific point in time, Rio Tinto in Australia, their CEO at that time coined the phrase, the mine of the future. And the goal or the objective of that was pretty audacious. And that was to completely autonomize their operations. And there were a number of test cases in Pilbara region, which is uh, Western Australia. And the idea was to make a fully autonomous mine that's more efficient, it's more, it's safer. Um, and I think there were some pretty ambitious goals. And over the course of trying to migrate to autonomy, they uncovered there were, there were certain technical pitfalls as well as um, change management. There's always going to be this cultural problem of if we replace a human with a robot, what happens to the human worker? And you have to, you have to get the workers to understand that their, their environment will be safer and they'll be able to operate out of a safer environment, um, or coexist with, with autonomous machines. And the original idea was to have people working in tele, telematics or teleremote operations from what were called remote operating centers or rocks, which is the same concept as flying drones from a trailer, say, halfway around the world, or UASs or unmanned vehicles or aerial vehicles. But this idea of telematics um, gained a lot of traction, and that's used quite frequently in underground mining now, where you have a surface person operating, say, a hammer drill to take medium-sized rocks that were liberated into smaller rocks that fit through crushers and fit through screens and and can fit onto um, in, onto belt lines or into trucks for haulage. So there was a big run up and everyone was excited about this idea of the fully autonomous mine of the future. Well, now we fast forward from 2008 and there are s between 50 and I believe 100 fully autonomous or driverless trucks operating in Pobara for Rio Tinto. Um, and there are other things like their rail lines, their, their heavy duty haulage from pit to port, which are fully autonomous, no driver on board. There's still some human intervention in telematics, but what we want to get to is a self-learning machine, something that understands its environment through digital visual visualization, through LIDAR and other kinds of scanning techniques, processing that information, trying to, to match up what its task is to the environmental changes or consistencies and continue to do its tasks in a repetitive manner. And I'd say the maturity, if you were to look at, say, a, a, a hype curve, which is a Gartner tool, I'd say we are past the pit of despair. And now there's a pretty good sequence of what tasks or what machinery or what assets can be the first candidates for fully autonomous, self-driving, self-aware vehicles versus those that are going to be a little longer on the evolution path. You mentioned that there's a lot of innovation happening within the industry. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about where the divide is. I, I know a lot of autonomous products and deployments are coming from companies like Sinjin. Are partnerships happening between the technology space and mining more broadly? Or is a lot of this development happening in-house and within the industry? That's a that's a terrific question. And when I when I got into the mining industry to begin with, my roots were really Silicon Valley and startups and technology and communications, not in extractive industries. I was pulled in through a very, very strange path to be pulled into this through a comms company that I was running. And as I started to understand I was a hypocrite that that what mining does produces the things that I use there's going to be a greater need for those things. So I need to either embrace what the mining industry does. And I, and I think I did a pretty good job of that, being able to bring together the mining industry's needs and requirements with my friends in the Valley who had really cool breakthrough technologies or cutting edge technologies. And I got them to work together in the sand, sandbox on a number of different projects um, from energy savings through ventilation on demand using IoT sensors and Raspberry Pis. And I found that it was really a cultural you know, smash up by telling my friends in the mining industry that if you 
if you understand there's a wealth of technology, you just have to be open to it instead of taking a defensive posture, which was really, you know, the mining industry has been under the microscope for a very, very long time. And they've been getting much better with their management of reclamation of lands, um, what treatment of water, um, and at the same time over in the valleys, letting them understand that they cannot be antagonistic towards extractive industries and still ride carbon fiber bikes and want their Teslas and use all of their, their electronic components, their MacBooks and everything else in their phones, their smart devices, if they right. don't understand that it's a critical industry. So I was able to bring these two together and start to go down the path of doing trial projects and things like that. So with respect to your question, whereas mining used to be this little um, controlled environment where mining technology companies and mining vendors only sold to mining purchasers or buyers um, and who would provide feedback of what are the next features and functions we need. We've sort of been able to create um, a world of agile thinking and design thinking. And a lot of the terms that we use in Silicon Valley are starting to, to seep into the mining industry. So we do use lean agile for for development of initiatives, understanding problem statements, how to write the perfect problem statement on a mine, and then send those back to people who used to be on the outside who are being pulled in or allowed in to work together with mining companies. So in answer to your question, in short, companies like Syngin are absolutely necessary for embedded software and, and the types of products that you produce and the, and the technologies you produce to, to be included in vehicle intervention systems, fatigue monitoring systems, um, guidance systems for for um, you know robotic machines or robotic assets or fleet management systems. Since you work at the Colorado School of Mines, I'd love to hear how your curriculum is changing and and how students are starting to engage with the transformation that's coming from the get go we're preparing them that they'll be part of a, of a future that requires not just understanding geology and permitting and uh, mineral processes, mineral processing and extractive metallurgy. Um, they also need to understand electrical engineering and computational sciences and mechanical engineering and advanced material sciences and advanced chemistry. And, and so the mining engineer or the mine engineer of the future that comes out of our school is going to have a very broad understanding of those interdisciplinary um, projects or, or how those different facets of other, of, of, of other industries or other technologies have to come together seamlessly and coexist in the stack, as you said before. Um, so a mining engineer is going to know a lot more about software and know a lot mm -hmm. more about um, writing algorithms and a lot more about how to program robot, robots, how to maintain robots, and how to how to deploy those in a way that's safe for everyone. And in return, their value continues to go up in the world. And we're talking mm -hmm. about the engineers. Their value continues to go up. We will always be at a deficit where we're constantly in need of, of new engineers as older engineers retire out or leave the business. How do you imagine a greater deployment of autonomous vehicles might impact the sustainable efforts and practices of the space? I mean, I think the perfect world of autonomous machines is that they operate without any idle time. They, they are task specific. They can run 24 seven without shift changes. Um, if they are electrically produced and they're charging using solar, uh, onboard solar and onboard energy storage, you can envision a future very similar to the big problem right now with drones is they have to come back down and charge. But the drones of the future will be along either beams of energy in the sky, which there are six different companies that I know of personally that are working on sort of Tesla type beams of energy that power those drones while they're task, task specific or task, uh, they're in operational mode. Um, same thing with autonomous vehicles. If they can run 24-7, 365 with no downtime, there's no startup problems. There's no uh, wear and tear on the machines. There's no idle, which is just producing, if it's a diesel machine, just producing diesel particulate into the air. We have, mm -hmm. um, I think, autonomous machines, and we could talk about that for another hour, about what they can do to help 
us become more environment or stay more environmentally um, compliant. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Generally speaking, the autonomous vehicle stack involves sensors, it involves hardware, it involves cloud computing. Uh, I'm wondering if there are any additional components of autonomy that we can find in the mining space that are of particular interest these days. Yeah, I mean, one comes to mind and and it was always a fringe thing because it was more of a hobbyist thing, but it, it literally fell into our lap and, and ours, not so much Colorado School of Mines, but um, a terrific professor, uh, Dr. Craig Bryce, who's who runs the Advanced Manufacturing Laboratory, and I work together on this, this customer-related project, which turned into a commercial venture, and that is as older and older machines that are not autonomous and not good candidates for full autonomy are still out there in the workforce, the cost to our environment and to our carbon input, our carbon footprint of manufacturing big, heavy parts for old machines that are near the end of their life. Mm -hmm. um, what was the best way we could approach that? And the idea of mobile 3D printing in alloys is is like a no brainer. And mm. so we started down that with this particular company. And the next thing you know, we have a we have a company now that does um, additive manufacturing, where we're looking at different alloys as feedstock in arc deposition printers. And eventually it'll be laser powder bed uh, fusion printers um, to print very, very small parts just in time, just as a machine breaks. You can envision a future where a fully autonomous robotic machine already is self-aware and knows that a part is going to fail within the normal maintenance period or an unplanned failure and mm -hmm. sends or telegraphs its particular request to the to the cloud and there's a digital file ready to send to the deposition printer that 3D prints in alloy all autonomous the new part that new part goes into the maintenance bay the machine uh, ends up there between shifts or at a downtime and the part is mated up using a robotic technician a robotic maintenance technician will take that 3D printed part so yeah I mean they do that on remote spaces like the internet International Space Station. So it completely makes sense that these technologies would be made available at these mining sites, which also can be totally off the grid. So that's really fascinating. And uh, it obviously supports the sustainability efforts and the sustainability conversations the space has been going through. Because anytime you can replace a part, as opposed to an entire vehicle, that obviously saves materials. And you know, it, it's funny because Sinjin really thinks about things in the same way because the technology we build is a retrofit. It's designed to work in the vehicles fleet operators already own so they can get better value and, and longer use out of their investments. That's really important to know that, that the OEMs, original equipment manufacturers, have a vested interest in selling their product to stay solvent, to be profitable so they can innovate and do the next thing. And there is this mm -hmm. healthy competition between all of the major manufacturers and they have their own product development roadmaps for fully autonomous. But like I said before, the in the middle of the curve is the vast majority of the fleet that's out there working right now mm -hmm. that is not a good candidate. Um, to be replaced or it eats too much into the margin and the company cannot afford, say, a tier two, a tier three mine, and certainly a tier four or artisanal mine cannot afford the latest, greatest autonomous thing. So what can we do to retrofit? And if Sinjin mm -hmm. is a component to be able to add new embedded firmware or new software to, say, an ECU, an engine control unit, or some sort of vehicle intervention black box that's on board and make that machine autonomous, that extends the longevity of it and reduces our appetite for raw materials and, and other things. So I think we can all coexist together. The yeah. companies that have a vested interest in fully robotic off the shelf right now and those that want to support their machines that are still going to, going to be in service for a long, long time. Well, Carl, I really appreciate all the time. Thanks so much. This has been super interesting. Luke, it's been fun. I, I love the questions um, and I like how it goes all over the map. and and hopefully I've provided some insight and, and really uh, look forward to uh, the future of Autonomous with uh, Sinjin being a part of that. Yeah, sounds great. So am I. <laughs> I will, uh, I'll talk to you later, all right? Sounds Thanks good. again.